the work outside um, that I'm making with that highly figured marble. The concept for those pieces actually starts off with things like this, which is what happens when you stack spheres together. Um, and inevitably, they produced, you know, extremely interesting regular, well, to me, interesting anyway, maybe not to other people, but um, extremely regular things which relate to all kinds of packing in nature, whether it's uh, atomic structures or molecular structures and so on. Um, this is kind of derived from the very simplest kind of packing, which is a, a sort of tetrahedron. It's the kind of mother of all forms, in a sense. I mean, it looks a fairly modest thing. Um, but then if you then extrapolate from that and start putting spheres where they fit naturally, you start to develop um, things like this, which are, which are sort of um, developments of that tetrahedron shape. And then um, what I've done is, is work uh, with those sorts of forms using those little balls and then infilling with wax. So this is a kind of uh, a, a variation or an extrapolation of a tetrahedral shape. So uh, the reason I'm using that very highly figured marble is because these are highly regular, highly ordered um, structures. And I very much like introducing that sort of random element, this extraordinary swirling of these different chemicals that have fallen into the, into the marble when it was at a sort of molten stage deep in the earth. Um, and uh, I kind of, uh, I don't think that figured marble is appropriate for, for a lot of things, but actually for me, it's very appropriate for these very highly ordered forms that I'm making at the moment. Um, I was talking about hexagonal packing. I mean, this is a good example of it. This is actually part of a hornet's nest that came out of our roof. Extremely highly ordered uh, hexagonal packing. I mean, it is, uh, again, it's one of, the, one of the fundamental ways in which things fit together. There are only three regular forms that tessellate on a two-dimensional surface, you know, a square, um, an equilateral triangle, and a hexagon. And, and so you find this hexagonal packing in many, many different forms from the, uh, from the, 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 the um, honeycomb and, the, the, in this case, the hornet's nest. Um, to things like basalt, um, the giant's causeway, and that hexagonal packing, because it's how things fit together. Um, another uh, kind of geometry I've got very interested in over the years is, is something called spiral philotaxis, which you can see in uh, lots and lots of growth patterns in plants. Um, and you see it uh, most obviously on the head of a sunflower, that, those sort of spirally shapes. Uh, uh, and also the arrangements of leaves on a plant. It's all to do with efficient packing. And actually, when you analyse these sorts of forms, they're, uh, visually they're very interesting. They're actually mathematically extremely interesting because they relate to the Fibonacci sequence and also to the golden proportion in a way that one would never uh, understand, uh, you know, unless you really got into it. And in fact, that relationship with the golden proportion that these, uh, that these plant forms, this plant geometry has, is something that's only really been recognised in the past few decades. And human beings have always used the golden proportion because it's a satisfying thing in architecture, in painting, right the way back to um, classical times and before. Uh, but, but it turns out that actually hidden deep in the structure of, of these plant growth patterns, uh, they are actually based on the golden proportion in terms of a circular representation of it. Um, so uh, this is uh, this kind of pattern, the spiral philotaxis pattern is something that I used for the large uh, sculpture called Seed for the Eden project that I did a few years ago. And in fact, I was involved in the design of the building as well. And the roof structure is also based on this same plant geometry, which turns out to be a very, very viable and uh, useful structural principle for making a roof, um, which the engineers got very excited about. So yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating, um, fascinating uh, mathematical uh, arrangement to do with efficiency, to do with packing as many seeds in as it possibly can. Yeah, I mean, what is fascinating about the geometry that you find in something like plant growth, um, uh, and the same applies to all sorts of patterns in, in nature, is that over enormous periods of evolutionary time, um, because the plant, it's been advantageous for the plant to have as many seeds in the seed head as possible, it actually uses these fundamental mathematical principles just through a gradual process of natural selection. Um, so, you know, nature, uh, both organic and inorganic nature, uses these 
things which are, which are really best understood in terms of mathematics and geometry. And there's another very interesting one I've got um, uh, very concerned with over recent years, which is a chemical pattern. It's where you get two chemicals that won't mix and they form these rather amazing um, maze-like or labyrinth-like patterns, uh, which turn out to be the basis of the kind of stripy and spotty patterns that we see in animals and fish. So, if, for example, if you look at the back of a mackerel, that wonderful pattern on the back of a mackerel, or a zebra, or a tiger, um, those were actually laid down as chemical patterns on the on the uh, exterior of the embryo at a very, very early stage through these two chemicals that won't mix. And then later pigmentation comes in and then those patterns become something that organic life uses often for camouflage. Um, so again, the organic world through many, many millions of years of natural selection, it uses these inorganic phenomena and these geometric phenomena to create useful things for them to survive. I've used, uh, on a number of sculptures, I've used um, this idea of one continuous line, which obeys these rules that, that are laid down by the chemical patterns, which are, for example, if you think of it as a maze, um, the path of the maze would go on forever. The, the hedges, if you think of it as a maze, can meet in threes and can end. And if you obey those rules, one can go on improvising without repeating oneself uh, infinitely um, within, those, within those rules.